Hello everybody, I'm Nick and in this video I'm going to show you how you can get the most out of Swagger's API describing capabilities in ASP.NET Core. Swagger is a topic that I haven't touched since the very first video of this series, so what I really want to do is just recap what Swagger is. Swagger at its core is just a way to describe our API and it comes with many fancy features including a UI where it can actually allow us to see how the API looks like, what objects we're expecting to return, and just describe it in general. So if I give my API to a mobile developer or a web app developer, they can actually write the front end for this API using Swagger because Swagger essentially describes what they need to code around. And this is very helpful even for business people that just wanna quickly hit the API and test it or even QAs, uh, they can do this with Swagger. So it is very important as you understand to actually document our API in depth. So currently if I just run the application, we can see that Swagger comes with this UI, which is automatically generated from our controllers. So I then the controller is converted to this, and then our endpoints are converted through the uh, methods in those controllers. But all you get is just some example value. You can get parameters if you actually have query string parameters or uh, root parameters. But it looks very empty. It doesn't actually describe it. Uh, in depth and that's what we want to do in this video. We want to actually take it to the next level and get as many features out of Swagger as possible. So I'm going to start from the very first thing I want to do here and that is to create a Swagger installer because we want to move the Swagger stuff, uh, DI initialization that is, into its own uh, file. So we're going to implement our installer, I'm going to implement its method and I'm going to go in, in this MVC in story class and then just move all those Swagger stuff right into the Swagger installer here and just import it. So nothing changed, we just moved it here. And what I want to do now is actually very simple. Swagger will just allow us to describe this API and give it more features by using an XML file. So it will look at the changes I'm going to do in our uh, controller now and just generate an XML file out of this and then we'll use that to show me some different things that we're going to look into in this video on the UI. So the first thing I want to do is I want to say var XML file equals and I'm just going to tell it where to read the file from so I'm going to say assembly.get executing assembly which is this application get name sorry not get files get name and then dot name and dot xml. You don't need to remember this by heart really. Uh, this is kind of just boilerplate code. And I have to do the same for the path. So xml path equals, and I'm gonna path dot combine. And I'm gonna say app context dot base factory comma xml file. And now I have the path. And what I want to do is I'm gonna do x dot include XML comments and then the XML path. So we will generate this XML and then we're gonna load it in, in DI. Uh, this XML will be auto-generated, but in order for us to auto-generate it, we actually have to change some things in the CS prompt. And this will be copy-pasted code. You can find this in the GitHub repo down below. I'm just gonna copy-paste it here. We're just gonna go under this very first property group and we're gonna add another one and all it's gonna have is this generate documentation file set to true, and then it's gonna suppress this warning. Uh, you don't really need to know what this is. This is just a warning regarding um, what we're adding here. Just stick it in there, and you don't need to worry about what exactly it is. All you need to know is this line will allow us to generate this XML file, which will now load in our DI to describe our uh, API better. So with this out of the way, we are open to actually extend uh, the way we describe our API. The first thing I want to show you, just to show you what we are talking about is I'm going to go here in this method. This is the get all method of the tags controller. And I'm going to add this. And this summary is a method summary. It looks like a comment and it's very similar. But because of what we did now, we can actually say something like, let's describe this endpoint, right? What is this? Get or returns all the tags in the system. And that's what it really does. So if I now run this with this uh, method summary on this endpoint, let's see what happens. As we can see here, this endpoint now also has this comment saying returns all the tags in the system. 
This is nice because it just describes what this endpoint is uh, supposed to do and we don't even have to expand it. Imagine having one of these comments on every method, you just know what this does. Uh, which, yeah, you could infer it by the uh, name of the endpoint, but it's nice to describe what this actually really does behind the scenes. Now, this is simple enough, but we can take it a step further. Let's go ahead and do this. I'm going to say, let me just stop debugging here. I'm going to say response code equals, and I'm going to say 200. And I'm going to close this response thingy. And here I'm going to say, again, returns all the tags in the system. And in this scenario, there is not no other response we're expecting uh, here. But if we look into something like the create endpoint, and I just paste this again, and we just say creates a tag in the system and then do the same for uh, 200. In this scenario we can also have 400 bad requests where you're unable to create a tag and we're gonna copy that and we are going to say response 400 and uh, we're gonna say that unable to create the tag due to validation error. So let's just run this and see how this one looks. So expanding that, we can now see that not only we have what the 200 is supposed to do, creates a tag in the system, but also 400 unable to create tag due to validation error. So we described our API a bit more now. This endpoint is more self-descriptive and you don't need to assume anything. But we can take it another step further. How will we do that? Well, you see, here is a request body, create tag request. We can actually add something called a remark. So we're going to say remarks, and we're going to expand that. And in here, we can essentially leave comments about this endpoint. And uh, those comments are actually supporting Markdown. Uh, so let's, let's see how this looks like. Uh, sample request would go here and I'm gonna say post and it's API v1 dot tags to create and I'm gonna let me just expand that a little bit more and I'm gonna say name some name for our tags uh, and that's it. So if I save this and if I run this again, and in fact, let me just make this bold and I can do this just to show you that Markdown is actually supported here. So let me just run this. And now I expand this and see, we can see the sample request and the request is in bold because again, Markdown supported. And this is in code uh, tags because we have two tabs, so four spaces, uh, which is how a code tag can appear one of the two ways. Uh, I actually did a mistake, this should be tag name here. But again, you can see this and this is something you can copy and then when you try it out, you can actually paste it here and execute it. The problem I have with this approach, however, for samples is that the code, this request and this comment can actually get outdated and we don't want that. Here's where I'm gonna put some magic into this example. I'm going to delete this remark and I'm going to leave remarks just as something that you might want uh, to leave as a comment, potentially a warning for this endpoint. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a package here. And this package name is slash buckle.aspnetcore.filters. And what this package will actually do is amazing because we no longer have to um, rely on comments that actually can get outdated if our object change. So let me just show you what this does instead of just telling you. I'm gonna make a folder here and I'm gonna name this examples. And this exists because of course I've done this before. So let's just say swagger examples. And then I'm gonna make another one here. I'm gonna name it requests. 
and another one and I'm gonna name it responses and I'm gonna go in the requests and I'm gonna create a new class and this class will actually be named after this object so create tag request example and this class will now implement the I examples provider interface and the generic type parameter we accept will be the request we want to make an example out of so in this case create tag request and i'm going to implement the only method this interface has and that is get examples and all i need to do is return a new object of this type and just set the let's say tag name is one of the properties so tag name and name is as new tag this will almost automatically work like magic. The only configuration you need to do for this to work is to go under your Swagger configuration and put one line. And this line is services.addSwagger examples assembly, from assembly off. And we're gonna use a startup again. There is also another small configuration we need to do here and that is in under this Swagger doc line, we need to say x.example filters. And this will, uh, add the filters and this will add a register the filters in the eyes so if we just run this let's see what we did here so that's the create tags in the system endpoint and if i expand that you can now see that the example value is no longer just tag name string it is an actual value that if i just try out and run it will actually error because I'm of course unauthorized. But if I was authorized, it would actually create the tag and I don't need to edit this. This is nice because imagine in a more complicated scenario where you might have currency here or you might have something with limitations in length. Giving an example actually tells the person that's about to use this that this is how this is supposed to look like. And this is very helpful. This is good for the requests, but actually we can take this step further and make the same thing for the responses. So we got the tag response. We're going to go to the responses folder and create a new class. And I'm going to name this tag response example. And same thing, I'm going to implement the same interface, iExamples provider. And I'm going to use the object that this endpoint returns. I'm going to implement it. So I'm going to say new tag response. And this tag response has a name and the name is new tag in this scenario there's something else we also need to do because this won't just magically work when to specify what we're returning here and in Swagger we can do this using the produces response type object so i'm going to say produces response type and then we're going to say what uh, type we want to return so i'm going to say type of tag response and then comma and we're going to specify the status code so in our scenario is 200. In fact, that's incorrect. That's 201 because we created so. Uh, and that is enough to let us know um, what we're returning on success. And we can also set another one here. And if I just change this to actually not return a new, just anonymous error, but return the item we created in the previous video, which you can find right now in the top right corner of, the, of your screen. I'm going to say new error response with a single error model quite lengthy we can make this better and I'm gonna say message equals this there is no field to back this up and in this case we're gonna say that we return an error response when this is 400 we can make this prettier I'm probably gonna make another constructor for this so let's run this and see what happens oh and of course this is also false it, this response is 201 so let's run this so looking at this again if i expand that here we now see a more complete and more nice example we have our request example we have our success code and we describe what it does we also have this which let me just get back to this in a second and then we have the example value of the response the good response and then I could have an example value of the bad response as well. I just didn't configure it now, but we could make an error response uh, example as well. See, this is the content type that the response is supposed to look like. So it's not text plain, it's not text JSON, it's actually application JSON. So we can also configure that. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to go at the very top level because everything returns that type. And we are going to say 
produces application post slash JSON. Let's see what this does. So expanding that again reveals that there's no longer any other option other than just application JSON because that's what we really return. So as you can see, this very, very nicely describes exactly what our endpoint is supposed to do. It tells us what the example value looks like, the example response looks like, what headers we accept, and then some user-friendly descriptions. This is very nice, very helpful. And if we had links, which is something I will do in a future video, I will just show you how we can add them here as well. And then this is something that needs to happen on every single endpoint. Of course, I will not show every single endpoint, but every single one can actually work in the very same way that I um, show you right now. This is all I had for this video. Leave a like if you liked this video, subscribe for more content like this, and I'll see you in the next video. Keep coding.